At the north end of the Mozambique Channel, between mainland Africa and Madagascar, the island of Mayotte belongs geographically to the Comoros archipelago. Mayotte is made up of about 30 islets and two main islands, Grande Terre and Petite Terre. It lies behind a double coral reef in the middle of a vast lagoon, one of the largest on the planet. The island in the lagoon owes its existence to volcanic activity. But the original volcano has practically disappeared, sunk into the Indian Ocean and worn away by erosion. Mayotte has very little high land. And yet winds laden with humidity coming in from the ocean meet enough obstacles to form clouds which then water the luxuriant tropical vegetation. The plant species on Mayotte originate in different places and are perfectly adapted to an environment which is not always propitious. About 50 of them are endemic. Others have been imported from nearby or distant regions by man, by the sea, or by the wind. The flying fox is the largest of the bat family. With the maki, a lemur, it is one of the island's emblematic animals. But when it comes to color, the fish in the lagoon steal the show. The colors also remind us that we are in France, all the more so since Mayotte became the 101st French department in April 2011. This indicates a status, but also a choice in favor of Republican institutions expressed by 95% of the population in the 2008 referendum. The exceptionally high fertility rate, five children per woman, partly explains the rise in the number of inhabitants, a number multiplied by seven over about 50 years. Mayotte's population is very young. 55% of the population is under 20, the highest percentage of any French territory. This demographic dynamism means that there are huge needs as far as education is concerned. Ninety-five percent of the inhabitants are Muslim. A very moderate version of Islam exists here, which leaves other beliefs free to express themselves. This is a tolerance favorably disposed to respect the many traditions. You could drive around Mayotte in a car, the island has good infrastructures and the tropical rainfall doesn't unduly disrupt a well-run network. It's an undoubted advantage for the planned development of tourism, a sector that is hoping for a rapid increase in availability of accommodation. The way of life in the lagoon is a formidable asset to tourism. In the field of leisure activity, Mayotte has a wide choice to offer. Activities are always in harmony with natural surroundings. Long-haul airliners land at Zaozi. As the airport is established on Petite Terre, you have to take a barge to get to Grande Terre. The barge is a veritable institution here. When the slightest thing goes wrong with it, the life of the department grinds to a halt. On the east coast of Grande Terre, Mamoudzou is Mayotte's main town. The administrative capital began to expand in the 19th century, swallowing up very ancient villages as it grew. The barge is so vital for Mamoudzou that they've invented the verb to barge. So when you take it to travel from one island to another, you barge. It's a key expression in the vocabulary of the inhabitants, the Mahorans. Mahore is the Comorian name for Mayotte. The town of Mamoudzou exerts a powerful attraction on the people of Mayotte. In fact, one third of the total population lives there. The center of the area is situated on a steep hillside, a geographical configuration that doesn't help traffic flow. The 
bustle in the town owes much to Mayotte's commercial vocation. The Portuguese, who were the first Europeans to land here in the beginning of the 16th century, discovered an island that was already turned towards trade. Mayotte was a busy staging post. The descendants of the great travelers and merchants seem still to be present at this crossroads of different cultures. Mayotte's vitality is clearly evident in the covered market near the port. Owing to the lack of space, the stalls spread all around the outside. It's a dizzying mixture of heady smells, vibrant colors, and powerful flavors. In the covered market, you can find the products that the countryside of Mayotte displays in abundance. Most of them are of vegetal origin, like the bread, edible leaves that are very varied and much appreciated in the traditional cuisine. Pride of place has been held for centuries by the spices. Because of them, ships by the thousand made the voyage, and thanks to them, whole empires were founded. For a long time, spices were used as currency. Even today, they're still very meticulously weighed. In the market, there is cooked produce too. The mama brochetti grill kebabs and marinated chicken wings. The green banana is a starchy food that is widely used in Mahoran cooking. It can be prepared in many ways. The yam is another popular starch. The roots of a shrub that originated in South America demand an enormous amount of preparation. This is dry manioc. Here we're pounding it to turn it into flour, and with the flour we make a thing called kima. Kima is a sort of puree, but thicker than puree. The Bwini, the women of Mayotte, look after their elegant appearance. Even when they're grating coconut, they wear a beauty mask, the mzinzano. Using a piece of coral, they reduce sandalwood to a powder diluted with a little water. The perfumed mask serves both as a protection against the sun and as part of the costume. You see, she's already made up. She's put the mask on and it's dried. At the same time, if you like, when it's dry like that, that's when they take a little bit of it to make designs. Sometimes women have motifs, like circles and little flowers. The mask is an important element of the art on Mayotte. It gives a concrete form to an abstract reality, a god or a feeling. It can even foster the oral tradition. The works I've created have a title, in fact, it's Zarkalo, which means the trace, the imprint. And we have many tales, many legends that have survived, in fact, which disappear with the generations. I try to pass on the little that I know, particularly legends, by bringing them to life. Traditions exist because they are passed down. And like traditions, the mask reveals the soul of a people and its deep aspirations. The young also help to foster traditions. To give regional music what it needs to be heard, a collective has been formed. It's called Tsenga, which means to clear the way in the Mahoran language. To clear the way, to reveal new talents and help them to exist. Several of the archipelago's artists are involved, like Mtoro Shamu, 
There are many influences in Mayoran music, because we are incredibly lucky. Mayotte is an island right next to Madagascar, which itself is not far from Africa. And there's also Reunion. There are quite a few things around us, so I think the influences on Mayoran music come from all around us. The Mayorans really need their music, they need their culture. I'm sure that this music is ready to be exported, but we have to find the right people, and then that will be that. <laughs> The barge takes a well-established route to cross the stretch of sea. Even though the barge hasn't got much of a draft, the coral reefs in fact are fearsome traps waiting for unwary sailors. You only pay for the trip from Grande Terre to Petite Terre because, in any case, you'll have to do the return trip at some time or another. The French landed here in order to prevent the English from settling, but also because they were looking for a bridgehead to Madagascar. Mr. Atumani knows the story well. There it is, France Square. The square is very important because it commemorates the French settling on Mayotte between 1841 and 1843. The French didn't fight for the island. They bought it from the last sultan of Mayotte. The governor moved into a residence inspired by Gustave Eiffel. Of course, it's a building that served both as the seat of administration and as the residence of the governor. It was built to standard, with terms of reference, which meant that you could live there without suffering over much from the heat and the humidity. The two great enemies of the Europeans who settled in the Indian Ocean, particularly on Mayotte. A detachment of the Foreign Legion is garrisoned on Petite Terre. With its recruits from the four corners of the world, the troops are commanded from a staff headquarters based in Réunion. Lake Tiani lies in the crater of an old volcano. The green color of the water is due to a strong concentration of sulfur. A beautiful tropical bird that can often be seen here is the Payonke, or white-tailed tropic bird. The color of the sulfurous water stands out against that of the ocean. In the east of Petite Terre, the Moya beach gives on to the open sea and not to the lagoon. The higher land on Grande Terre guarantees supplies of fresh water. The heat and humidity are particularly favorable to the production of citrus fruits. But many tropical species are still very often imported. All along the road, there are people selling edible leaves and tropical fruits. The breadfruit is cooked over a wood fire. Flour can be produced from the breadfruit, whence its name. The western side of Grande Terre is much more hilly. Here there is no coastal plain, the villages run right down to the sea. Like, for example, Sada, Mayotte's second town, which enjoys a very airy climate. On Fridays, the day of prayer, life slows down a little. Many men wear the kufia, a Comorian cap embroidered by the women. The kufia is often decorated with verses from the Quran. Thus embellished, it can be an outward sign of wealth. 
As you go north, the island of Grand Terre widens. The high temperature, the lie of the land and the heavy rainfall are all beneficial to the forests and the rivers that flow through them. The women meet there to do their washing. In their wardrobes, one outfit stands out, the salouva, the traditional costume. Women occupy a very prominent place on Mayotte. In fact, it is a very matrilineal society. That is to say that the inheritance of family wealth comes through the women. But the men and the women all pull together, starting with the baker, Patrick Uex, who sells his specialities around the villages. Bread, pan au chocolat, croissants, macachas, all with different degrees of sweetness. You have to strike the metal as fast as you can because it cools down very quickly. Kasim Abdu is very good at salvaging metal parts that he hammers down to a thickness of just several millimeters. This is a leaf spring from a lorry and I'm making a chumbo out of it. The chumbo is the traditional machete. That's good. In the countryside, it's rare to come across a man who is not carrying his favorite tool. Whoa. On Mayotte, there are six forest reserves spread over the country. On the hilltops over 500 meters high, primary forest survives in places. The presence of man has changed the forest, but many species are still found there, and some of them are endemic. Something just moved in the branches. A tail? A monkey? No, it's a maki, a small lemur. Three Mackies. Mackies never go around alone. Michel Charpentier, a naturalist, is an expert on lemurs. It's an animal that was originally endemic to Madagascar and that over a few hundred years got used to living here. This is the only place in the world outside Madagascar where you find lemurs in the wild state. It's an animal that, while it is protected, is not for the moment endangered. However, as it's an animal that can only live in a forest environment, the deforestation that is taking place on Mayotte obviously has an effect on the Maki population, which has a tendency to retreat towards the villages to find the food it no longer finds in the forest. The Maki enjoys its food and is not backward in coming forward. Come on, come on. That's a baby, the tiny one. Look at its little head. Come here, come here. Oh, he took it. He's eaten it. He snatched it from my hands. Stop. Oh, he's lovely, that one. What a lovely Mackie. He was on me, did you see? When the Mackie wants to grab a piece of fruit, he's afraid of nothing. Not even the camera. <laughs> In 
In privileged natural surroundings, the clay and straw-built houses blend perfectly into the landscape. Sweet, perfumed vanilla mingles with the nature of Mayotte. This climbing plant originated in Central America. In order to grow, it has to have a support. Tulagdoi Halidi cultivates vanilla. It's an orchid, in fact, and it's the only one that produces an edible fruit. It flowers once a year, unlike other orchids that flower all year round. The pollination of each flower has to be done manually. After pollination, you have to wait seven or eight months for it to reach maturity. For example, these are already mature. I should pick them and go and prepare them. A small production, which just goes on getting smaller. In the center of the island, there's a splendid garden containing many tropical species, with, among others, its frangipani trees. It's part of a property that formerly belonged to the famous perfume maker Jean-Paul Guerlain. Over several hectares, he grew one of his main raw materials, the ylang-ylang. The tree has flowers with long petals that give off a powerful perfume. François Mollaro considers that the ylang-ylang is in its element here. An ylang in the Mozambique Channel, that's why its essence is exploited. It gives all year long, it produces all the year. There's no outside factor that can slow down the evolution and the production of the flowers. But here it's specific to the Mozambique Channel because there's the level of humidity it needs. The weather's warm, it rains. In short, it likes it here. And it's only produced here. To extract the ylang ylang essence, they use a technique that's been known since antiquity, hydrodistillation. So once the harvest is done, the weight of your harvest will determine the volume of water you're going to put in the still, which in turn will determine the choice of the still. When your essence starts to trickle, you know you've got between about six and seven hours to get the very best out of the flower. That's to say the extra superior, the extra S. On Mayotte, the flowers never cease to surprise us, like la rose de porcelaine or torch ginger. These are torch gingers, and these particular ones were picked this morning. Now, there are two sorts of colors, in fact. There's a pale pink and a slightly stronger pink. These flowers have stems that can grow to two meters high and have quite a plastic-like texture, which means they hold up quite well. On the other hand, they give off no smell. The limit of the Mayotte Lagoon is formed by a double reef of coral. One of these is out to sea, and the other is just by the land. Between these two limits, the lagoon stretches over an area nearly five times bigger than the island itself. Over three quarters of the shoreline, a very specific form of vegetation has got a foothold. This forms the mangrove swamp, a very precious natural environment. Niels Bertrand. The mangrove swamps are totally bound up with the lagoon. Firstly, they are ecosystems that allow the diversity to exist in the lagoon, since the mangrove swamp filters the rainwater, which carries a large quantity of soil. By the way, it is said that the mangrove swamp acts, in a way, as the lungs of the lagoon. It's also a very quiet place, protected and tranquil from the many species of fish that come and shelter inside the mangrove swamp so that they can grow in safety and then populate the lagoon. Several species of mangrove tree make up the mangrove swamp, which plays an important protective role. This coastal forest also helps to protect the villages on the coast from any large waves when there are hurricanes, or even from a possible tsunami. The fringe of foam marks the outer limit of the lagoon. Beyond that line, the ocean gets suddenly much deeper. The coral barrier separates two very different marine worlds. Because on the ocean side, the sea life is different. 
So, there on the outside of the lagoon, that's where we've come to research, to observe the many species of dolphins that live around the island. There are two species in the interior lagoon, coastal species, and then there's all the rest, mainly on the outside, with near-barrier species that are sedentary. And then, again, the larger species, a bit further out, that are just passing through. But you can see about 15 species around Mayotte. The dolphin is not the only marine mammal to frequent the warm waters of Mayotte. There are also the humpback whales. The Mayotte lagoon is really a nursery. We have an enormous number of mothers with their young. The humpback whales spend the summer in the Antarctic and come here to give birth to their offspring during the southern winter. You can get quite close to some astonishing fish. For example, the manta ray. Although it belongs to the shark family, the manta ray doesn't fear the presence of man. The two horns on its head have given rise to the nickname the sea devil. In fact, it is by no means a devil, since it feeds only on plankton and small fish. It's an animal of extraordinary size and elegance. It's marvelous, especially when it comes back with its mouth wide open like that. Really impressive. There, magnificent. Well, I hope we'll see some whales, as we saw the dolphins this morning, manta rays this afternoon. So whales this evening would be the icing on the cake. A mask and a snorkel are all you need to discover the coral depths and the incredible fauna that shelter there. The corals are found in very varying forms. They can be very small, but they can also spread out in order to absorb maximum light. Dead corals crumble and turn to sand. On the surface of the water, the sand can sometimes accumulate. Here's a sandbank full of birds, where there are large numbers of white terns. You can only cross the barrier at certain places, the channels. Everywhere else, it's impossible to avoid the obstacles. So, off to the Longogori Channel. It's also known as the S Channel because it follows the line of a former river, one of Mayotte's most renowned diving spots. Daniel Budé. What makes diving in Mayotte so special is the diversity, both in the richness of the corals, their excellent condition and the number of varieties, and also for the fish. The quantity of fish is unimaginable. And as in the S Channel, there has been no fish hunting for about 15 years. There are fish that are not afraid and that you can easily get close to, and there are huge numbers of them. In 1990, a marine reserve was created in the S Channel. In fact, between the ocean and the lagoon, the channel traces a natural canal about four kilometers long. There are strong currents flowing through it that ensure that the water is swirled around and renewed. The nature of the site and the protection it enjoys foster underwater life. Intense volcanic activity has left many vestiges on the island. They haven't escaped erosion by the sea and the wind. The erosion has pulverized the volcanic matter into black sand and carved the basaltic rocks. 
The hard, smooth blocks were formed by very hot lava that cooled very quickly. Mayotte is a real showpiece when you arrive by air. And the lagoon is an ideal place to take off from. Even if you're happy to stay on the surface of the lagoon, there's no lack of things to discover. Sometimes you can find a baobab growing right down on the beach. On Sundays, there's a crowd at Musical Beach. Families flock there to organize the vule. The Sunday picnic is a lively get-together where traditional recipes are enjoyed to the beat of the drums. A marine reserve has been created around Sazile Point, in the far south of Grande Terre. Guards patrol to preserve the place's authenticity. And there are some very characteristic tracks crossing the beach. There, those are turtle tracks. Now we'll see the place where it laid its eggs. There's the hole. It laid round about here. There are some eggs. 60 centimeters down. The turtle is one of the riches of Mayotte, and they're disappearing. If we let people kill turtles, and if we don't protect them, then there'll be no more turtles in Mayotte. Following some amazing instinct, marine turtles come to lay their eggs at exactly the same spot where they were born. A green turtle has dug a hole in the sand. The guards know this turtle quite well. It's already ringed. See, the rings are there. This is a turtle that was ringed here in Mayotte. It measures one meter three. We can only estimate it that it's about 50 years old. The turtle has come to lay her eggs. This turtle has started to produce its eggs, and she'll lay on average 50 eggs. There are up to three coming out at the same time. The baby turtles instinctively head towards the sea. The adventure is only just beginning. The departmental road network on Mayotte is quite good, but there can still be a few surprises. And the most beautiful beaches are easy to get to. The cultivation of sugarcane was abandoned at the beginning of the 20th century, mainly because of the competition from the West Indies. And yet the land of Mayotte is fertile. It's estimated that a good half of the country could be devoted to farming. But only a third of the workable land is put to use in very small plots. In this context, garden produce has real potential. Housewives receive advice on how to get the best from their kitchen gardens. Mutit Hirachi is an instructor. 
You can put in carrots, you can put in lettuces, web lettuce. It can also put in, we've put mint in there, and basil too, and other things, chives, and all that can grow here. Nature provides, but doesn't count the abundant resources that have to be used. Traditional methods help to get the best out of the treasures of nature. <laughs> the horse provides an ecological way to discover the island. First, because he moves around in silence. Then, because while completely respecting the environment, he manages to thread his way almost everywhere. Here the trail opens out onto an amazing bamboo forest. The giant bamboos of Mount Kombani. When you see the size of them, it's hard to accept that, botanically speaking, the bamboo is a herb and not a tree. Where the rain has washed away the fertile soil, there remains just a barren area, the Padza. Vegetation is sparse in the red desert of the Padzas of Dapani. Erosion by water has also scoured the slopes of Mount Shungi, an old volcano. The cone that survives is in fact the volcano chimney, the shaft where the lava flowed. It isn't too difficult to climb to the top of Mount Shungi, but you do have to pace yourself. Anrifani Mohamidi is a guide. The climb will last nearly an hour. At the beginning, it's more like a stroll through the forest, but the last part is pretty steep. Roots make it easier to get along as the slope gets steeper and steeper. You have to hope for some encouragement on the way. How was it up there? Very beautiful. And once you're up there, you have to come down. Oh, going up was fine, but it was really coming down that was hard. You have to earn it getting to the top. You have to climb to deserve the view. Near the top, the rich vegetation becomes more sparse. Victory! There we are, 594 meters above sea level. When you've got there, there's nothing to spoil the view. Far beyond its shores, the island of Mayotte transports the visitor. It takes him through an original world where old ways live on. It passes traditions that have come from afar, that come together and carry on forever through music. A natural beauty that must be preserved. That's the challenge that Mayotte has taken up. Mm hmm.